Welcome to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. Our goal is to help you maximize your church's potential. You'll hear from top leaders in children's, student, and family ministry about the principles and practices they use. Now here's your host, Nick Blevins. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 143 of the podcast. In this episode, I talk with Kurt Broadbeck all about what they call at their church the family framework. I'm really excited for you to hear this interview because this family framework that they have is really, really helpful. And it wasn't that long ago that we had somebody else on the podcast talking about kind of their plan and a framework that they have for families as it relates to kind of transitions and milestones. That was Matt Morgan in episode 134, and here we have Kurt talking about what it looks like at their church with the family framework, and we really just walk through what the framework is, what are the different components of it, particularly the pieces that maybe you might not be familiar with or you've never heard of, which there are a few for sure in there. They're doing a great job. I love uh, how they're using it in a way that they create events that parents and kids come to, but they also give parents and kids opportunities to experience some of the stuff on their own. And it's not an event that they have to host. But I feel like I'm telling you all about what's going to happen in there when you can just listen to it. Before we jump into that interview, though, I just want to let you know that if you are listening to this before the Orange Conference 2019 happens and you're going to be at the Orange Conference, there's a couple things I want to let you know about so that we can connect while you're there. So I'll be there. I'll be leading a breakout in the uh, next gen track. But I, I imagine a number of people want to take it. We're going to talk all about a comprehensive plan for families. And then... Kenny, Conley, Kevin, and I, who all kind of co-founded Ministry Boost, will be leading the first breakout on Yuli Day for there on Wednesday about how to boost your ministry. But that's really not what I want to tell you about. What I really want to tell you about is on Wednesday, we're hosting a lunch for anybody who's interested to come that you want to hear more about Ministry Boost and you lead, which is coaching that Orange provides that we you know partner with them for for coaching. So if you're interested in that, email me. And I'll get you an invite to that. Just email me at nick at nickblevins.com. That's on Wednesday during Yuli Day. And then Thursday and Friday, we will have a booth, you know, there at Orange Conference. It'll be there Wednesday night, too. You'll be able to find us there. But we'll also have a suite. So if you come upstairs and you want to sit up in the suite or hang out with us, maybe in between sessions or sit up there during a session, something like that, certainly come and find us. I don't have, I have no idea where it's going to be right now, but we'll certainly have – uh, you know, a sign out front wherever it's going to be upstairs and probably put it on social media while you're there. So if you're at Orange, check those things out. If you're not, uh, sorry, that took just a little bit there. But now let's jump into my interview with Kurt all about the family framework and how they help parents and kids celebrate transitions and milestones. Well, I'm talking with Kurt Broadback today. Welcome to the podcast, Kurt. Thanks for having me, Nick. Appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about you and your family and your church before we get started. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm married to my wife, Brooke. Uh, we've been married for a little over 15 years. Uh, we got three kids, an 11-year-old son, Corbin, eight-year-old daughter, Quincy. And then we just recently took a victory lap and we got a six-month-old at home, a little boy named Keller. Uh, we've been at our church. Uh, we're at Northview Church, which is in central Indiana. Uh, we have we have 11 locations. Uh, four of those are, are prison campuses. And so uh, my role is I'm family ministry pastor. I get to oversee kids and students at, at obviously, our seven locations. We don't really have much of a kids or student ministry kids going on in the prisons ministry. right now. Yeah, right now, right now. We do have a nursery at one of the women's prisons, but that's about it. Uh, but again, we don't even do anything with that. They just have yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So and some people, I doubt, I don't know if there's you know, how many people listen to every episode, especially because we'll get folks like yourself that are next-gen pastors, then we'll talk student ministry, then children's, then something that's for everyone, kind of like this one in some ways is for everyone. Uh, but some people might be thinking there's something familiar about, you know, 11 locations, former in prison. And that's because we had Zach Matchett from your staff yeah. on the podcast not that long ago. And he gave that same uh, overview of, of the okay. church. So yeah. just for anybody that's listening, you guys work at the same church. Zach leads in preteen, right? And, and yes. Mm -hmm. that for you guys yep. at your original campus, but also it sounds like helps with the preteen ministry all over. He does. He's got a role. He lives locally, but he acts central and he writes all of our curriculum for all of our fifth and sixth grade ministries at all, all of our campuses. So, yeah. And it was fun to talk to Zach just because, I mean, you know, everybody, we just started a fourth, fifth grade environment a few weeks ago and everybody, you know, is interested in that, but you guys have been doing it for a while. So it's cool to talk to somebody that had a, a preteen ministry going for longer than a, a year or two, you know? So that was, fun. yeah. 
Um, yeah, and I'd lean into Zach. Zach's the expert for sure on that. Yeah, it was great. It was great just to even just hear like, okay, what do you do? What does it look like? How has it changed? And it was helpful. You know, it was it was really good. And even like how it's expanded to all of your locations and and what grades it's included and what area it's under. Like some of those things change. So people should go back and listen to it if they didn't get a chance sure. to. Yeah. And then today we're going to talk about what you all call the family framework. So it's kind of like, to me, it looks like, and I guess I'll learn more, but it looks like your strategy for families and partnering with them and helping them uh, grow, you know, as kids get older and how do they maximize transitions and milestones and all that. So tell us what is the family framework? Yeah, sure. Uh, the family framework for us is just a combination of events and classes that set parents up to win. Uh, we believe that, um, you know, as, as I'm sure everybody listening to this podcast believes that parents uh, are the most important and they're the ones that are the primary faith influencers in the life of a child. But we also know that uh, many parents are struggling to figure out, okay, so what's, what's next? What do I do? When do I do it? Uh, and sometimes that, that overwhelming responsibility kind of paralyzes you. And so we just want to provide some easy, simple ways along the way uh, where you can win because we believe that if you taste a win, you want more. And you're going to go deeper. And so it's really our, our opportunities to kind of motivate the families to go a little bit deeper. How did it come about originally? And I'm sure it's grown, but like, how did it start? Yeah, you know, uh, we kind of formalized it about four and a half years ago, maybe five years ago. We kind of formalized it into a, a framework. But before that, uh, we were just doing events uh, to set mom and dad up to win. Uh, one thing that we think we're really good at as a church uh, as we believe we're really good at creating environments for spiritual conversations to happen. Uh, you know, and, and I think every, I come from the youth ministry world, Nick. And so uh, I think every youth pastor, that's kind of like their, like what God put inside of them. You know, I don't know if you remember like when your youth pastor made you ride a greased pig and you're not sure why you rode that greased pig, <laughs> but you know, you did it. Uh, and he had this crazy idea that all of a sudden was like, that was awesome. And then in the midst of it, hopefully he shared some spiritual conversations with you and it wasn't just fun. Um, but student ministry, we're good at creating environments, uh, but we're terrible at accountability and follow up. And parents, parents aren't awesome at creating environments for spiritual conversations to happen. Normally, it's like right after the door slammed that you get your shot in there about what they did wrong or why they should do something differently. Um, but you know what parents are awesome at? They're awesome at accountability and follow up. And so we started saying, how can we create an event uh, that helps mom and dad Instead of setting the church up to win, because we always set ourselves up to win, how do we set up an opportunity for mom and dad to win? And how do we let them taste that spiritual conversation victory where they go, man, that was that was awesome and meaningful. And I had a conversation with my teenager that mattered, and and that felt really good. And, and they looked to me for advice. And so uh, we started that with a couple events that we'll probably talk about here in a second. But one was called the Chili Bowl. Uh, for me, pornography uh, – Pornography is the reason I got into student ministry, um, because I believe that God uh, placed a calling on my life to be proactive, to help kids um, make the right choice the first time uh, so they don't get stuck in the habit um, or the, uh, uh, the destructive cycle of pornography. And I was taking a reactive choice uh, to ministry when I was in college, helping guys uh, that were battling pornography at that point, but had been battling it for a long time. And so I believe God said, hey, no, I need you to be involved when, when kids are making decisions for the first time. And so we started an event for dads and sons. Um, we called the Chili Bowl. Uh, it, was, it was three things that guys are drawn to, uh, uh, football, chili, and porn. We said uh, two were good, football and chili. And we said two have negative effects, chili and porn. And so we just did this event where we did flag football all day long, we had a big chili cook-off afterwards, and then we said, okay, now we're going to get together, and we're going to have a conversation about pornography. We're going to talk about the dangers of it. Uh, we got a presenter up there to talk about it, and then, and then we said to the dads, hey, dads, turn to your sons and say, it's about to get awkward. And so they did, and they turned and say, it's about to get awkward. And then we have the sons turn back to their dads and say, it's okay, you're always awkward. Uh, and we just kind of let the permission for the conversation to happen. And then we gave the dads these discussion guides and said, now go sit in the car and look at the windshield. Don't look each other in the eyes. That's going to be weird. But look at the windshield and, and have a spiritual conversation on your desire to help your son in this battle against pornography. And what kind of a family plan are you going to do? And we thought, is this going to work? Uh, but what was cool is you looked out and the entire parking lot's full of cars, half hour, 45 minutes after the event. 
And all of a sudden we start getting all these emails from dad saying, man, I never thought I could talk to my son about that. But, but because everybody was doing it, because my son gave me permission because he wanted to play flag football with me, uh, I had one of the best conversations I've ever had with my son. And that kind of started the family framework. We were like, I think this is something that's important. We got to help dads. We got to help moms. We got to help them win in spiritual conversations. That's awesome. I did obviously, as we talked leading up to the podcast or with the plan, you know, I didn't even know that that was the origin of it. And you're right. The key is how do you help parents have those important conversations? And they, and I think, like you said, they, they need that uh, assistance, the plan part of it, because they have the opportunities, they have the relational investment, they have, you know, the time if they make the time, uh, but don't always sure. have the tools, you know what right. I mean? And, and the right thing. So that's really good. So yeah. you, I, I would love for people to visit your website too. We'll put that link in the show notes. Yeah. You do a great job with like how it looks and, you know, the different, it's numbered, you know, one, two, three, four, and you can just see everything, which I love. But let's hit some specific elements in there, particularly the ones that are less common. So like you have child dedication yeah. on there, which is a very common one. But early on, another one you have is the parenting game plan. What's that? Yeah. So uh, first of all, if you go to our website, it's northviewchurch.us uh, slash family framework. You can actually see all of this kind of laid out there, and it might help if you if you're actually sitting at a computer right now and you want to be able to, able to kind of process as we're talking. But uh, the parenting game plan, uh, you know, it came up it came about because um, I was a youth pastor for about seven years at this point, and I was getting ready to to launch some more uh, family activities and and even some spiritual conversation guides for our parents. But I thought. How, how do they even know if they're if they're winning in the long run, and, and how do we help parents see that parenting matters? And so I had um, I had two families in my church that I had like all of their kids in student ministry, and all of their kids were awesome. And I don't know if you've had that where you're like, I don't know what those parents do, but I want to learn from them. I just want to be with them, you know. And so um, I invited them for dinner one night, and I said, I just I just want to know like what are you doing. Uh, to help your parents or your help, help your kids uh, be as awesome as they are. And the first family was like, man, well, we have these family values that we made together as a couple and we put them on our wall. And, and every time that we have to talk to our kids, whether it's discipline or encouragement, uh, we, we refer back to it and say, hey, here's, here's where you hit the mark or here's where you missed the mark on, on who we are as a family and what we're striving for as God tries to help us parent you. And I thought, wow, that's really good. And then the second couple was like, an, he's an engineer. And he's like, well, uh, we, uh, we decided that there were nine different areas of our family life. And we decided that we needed to define what our kids would look like when they're 18 years old if we won in each one of those nine different family areas. And then we basically went backwards from there and developed a plan to help us figure out, you know, what are some intentional things that we can do along the way to help them to get to where they want to be. He basically reverse engineered his children because he's an engineer. And I looked at him and I was like, What? Uh, and, and the other couple with us goes, do what he's doing. Uh, so, uh, anyway, so I, I reached out to that couple and I said, Hey, I don't want to create robotic families. I'm not trying to create a robotic curriculum that, that helps you make perfect kids, but I, I want to have a class, uh, that helps parents say that what we do matters. And if we could divide our family life up into those nine different areas that you've decided, if we could do that and then say, okay, what do we want for our kids? And how do we proactively parent throughout their life as they transition different phases with them? How can we, how can we, uh, do better than just hoping that when our kids are 18, they turn out? Uh, and so, uh, they wrote a book for us. Um, we have turned this into a life group curriculum. We also do it a couple times a year as like a seminar, a three hour workshop. Uh, and then we also within that booklet have put parenting activities so that, so that if you're married, you, you and your spouse would go out on a date. And you'd work through each of the nine areas and, and kind of talking about how you were raised, uh, how you want to raise your kids, and then develop and, and write what's your plan for your kids. And so it's really just a tool to help parents think intentionally about what do they want their kids to be when they when they grow up. That's great. And it's, I like that you put it in some different formats. So they can come do it in a seminar. They can do it in small groups with other parents. Can they do it on their own too? Do you, do you have a Yeah, absolutely. Or? Absolutely. Yeah. It's on our website. So if you go to that, that, uh, part of the website, the family framework part, you click on the number two tab, you can see below it says more info. And there's actually all the curriculum videos are on there where you could actually watch those. 
Uh, and then we have a companion guide booklet that goes with, uh, it, it fits all three formats, whether it's, uh, online, uh, or whether it's the, uh, class that they come to part one or two, uh, the same booklet works for all of it. That's great. I think helping parents be intentional, you know, with that thinking with the end in mind, kind of like the engineer does, you know, that's like a, yeah. seven, that's one of the seven habits, right? Of highly effective people begin with the end of mind or whatever. So he's right. doing that. And Orange talks about that too. If anybody follows Orange, uh, you know, that's a big orange principle, uh, even in that, in, in the book, parenting beyond your capacity. So uh, I love that you've created this parenting game plan, help them think intentionally about what they want to do. The values thing yeah. is great too. I remember, um, Oh, Lencioni's book, three keys for the frantic family or something. I heard yeah. him before I'd ever read the book. I heard him do a presentation about like, what does that mean? And how his family has values. And these are the three big ones. And then there, and I liked how they had like three big ones. Church was one of the big ones, uh, the family, you know, and, and it was one of them. I don't remember the other one. And then they had other ones and how he'd use it like as a decision making framework. So like, yeah, you got, you got to, your kid can take another sport, do two sports this semester. One's going to interrupt church. Um, we, one of our values is this, let's say it's fun or I don't know, whatever. Sure. Uh, yeah. Not, it's probably not fun, but like activity or pursuing things like that, but it's not one of the big ones, which is church. And he was talking about how you could use that as a filter. And I just, the, the, the engineer, I guess in me, it was just like, I loved having something, you know, like some kind of guy, right. some kind of principles, some kind of values to go back to, because otherwise every decision does feel who knows? Like, is it like it's on its own? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so I love that you're helping families <laughs> think that way. And then you have one that, and this one probably is more common, but I just wanted to see if there's anything unique about yeah. what you're doing. It's the faith commitment and baptism. What does that look like? Yeah. So, uh, we do, um, we do a class for parents. Uh, the, the, we tried to do them separately at first, Nick, and found that uh, a lot of people didn't come to the faith commitment class, but although it was the most important part of the two, uh, and, um, and we were having trouble getting them to come, but in order to be baptized, uh, for anybody under sixth grade to be baptized at our church, uh, we do ask that the parents take the baptism class ahead of time, uh, so that they know what their kids are, are saying when they go to get baptized. And so combining them together, um, now, um, every, everybody that get bat- every child that gets baptized in our church, um, their parents have attended this class. And, and so the faith commitment and baptism class, we've created two booklets for that. Again, um, I can uh, put those in the show notes for you or something, but, uh, they're, they're basically, we have a parent book. Uh, the parent book talks on adult level of what is salvation? Um, how do we receive it? What does the Bible say? And kind of walks the parents through that. And then, um, it turns the corner towards the end of the class and we say, okay, so now this is a complicated idea. How would you talk about it? Uh, with a child. And so we kind of use the bridge illustration. We use ABC. Um, and then uh, we have a child booklet that goes with it. And so in that child's booklet, it's basically for the parent to then take home and say, hey, um, this is when maybe maybe uh, your child starts asking questions about faith. And, and you got to know, hey, when are they ready? It's not like you take the class and then you go home and you're like, now I'm going to evangelize to my child and he's going to accept Jesus. Uh, but we say, take this class uh, and then when you feel like your child is asking the right questions, when they're, when there's, when they're, um, when there's actual curiosity, when they, they decide for themselves that they realize they're a sinner and that they, they need to be saved, then, hey, pull the booklet out. You've already been trained on evangelism and here we're going to give you an easy booklet to write the bridge illustration in. Uh, there's some, uh, we have some like fill in the blanks that things are spelled backwards that explain the good news and the gospel. Uh, but a tool just for parents to then talk on a kid level the idea of salvation. And then we do the same thing with baptism in that class. Uh, we talk again to the parents about what is baptism and how does our church understand what baptism is and the purpose of it and, and um, God's commandment for it. Uh, and then in that class uh, on the same thing, we have the children's uh, par- portion as well, where again, we use that booklet then for them to go back and say, okay, now how do you explain it in a kid way so that they can process it and understand it for themselves. And so we're just trying to give mom and dad the tools to have a kid version uh, understanding of that same conversation uh, in our, in our church. Mm -hmm. And then later on you have the Bible presentation, which, Mm -hmm. you know, I know of some churches that do this, but not many. Yeah. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. what does that look like for you and when does it happen? Yeah. Bible presentation. That's, that's been a huge one for us. Um, You know, we've done that for now um, a few years 
remember the first year we did it, a lot of parents didn't understand it. And, and all of a sudden, um, we do it in the main service, the presentation part, the, the celebration part. And so all of a sudden, all these second graders got up on the stage and there were a lot of parents in the audience that were like, wait, we didn't know that was happening. Uh, or we didn't take the class we should have taken it. We wanted our kids to be up there on the stage and celebrate it. <laughs> um, and so now, uh, we actually, uh, this last year, we were pretty excited. We, we, we had more second graders on the stage, uh, the one weekend we do it than actually we have on an, our average weekly attendance, uh, which was pretty cool across all of our campuses. And so that class, um, what we, what we like to do is we say, um, so up until second grade, a child is learning to read. But starting in second grade, in our schools, they're shifting to reading to learn. And so what should they be reading to learn? They should be reading God's word. We believe that they need to start developing habits in their life about second grade. When, when they're reading books to learn, they should be reading God's word to learn as well. And so we want to help them develop that habit. So we have all the parents come again to a class on that. We talk about the canonization of the Bible. Uh, and, and we like to, we like to talk about it like it's, it's something that we know that they all understand and they all get. And so we're like, we know you know this, but we just want to go over it and, and we'll go into how was the Bible, how the Bible came to be and how, you know, how did it get picked and which books get picked and how is it laid out and how do you read it for yourself? And, and you can just look at the eyes of the parents and they're like, you act like I know this, but I've never heard any of this before in my whole life, you know? Uh, and it's become one of those classes that parents have asked to take multiple times now uh, because they want to just keep learning. Okay, let me learn more about this again, like, again, how did the Bible come to be? What is this canonization thing? Uh, how is it laid out and how am I supposed to navigate it? And then we turn the corner at the end of the class and we say, okay, so now we're going to be presenting your kids with the Bible uh, on the stage and, and actually you're presenting it to them. You're giving it to them. And so again, we have a student guide for this as well. And the student guide is really just helping them develop a plan for them to start reading it at home. So at the end of it, it's really just like a little contract, like, Hey, the parent has a contract that says, hey, I will promise to either send you to bed five minutes early or 10 minutes early, or I'll create a quiet space for you and me to read uh, the book of Mark together. And we're trying to get them just to read the book of Mark. That's what they're making a commitment to do after the Bible presentation. Uh, and then the student says, hey, I, I promised to, to try and hide God's word in my heart by by reading the book of Mark, and here's the plan that I want to develop and uh, do together in our home. So whether it's they do it at nighttime or in the morning time or with mom and dad reading it with them or they want to do it by themselves, they kind of make a little little contract, if you will, uh, for them to kind of start Bible reading. And so we do that presentation, and then we ask them to try and read through the whole book of Mark, uh, and that's kind of their goal for reading their own Bible. That's great, and that's definitely an example of, like, parents want their kids to – read the Bible, they want to help them, but they could use some help in, in, in you know, starting that. So that's really good. Yeah. That's well, that's well timed too. And the fact that you do it in the service as kind of, you know, this the ceremony, so to speak. We think that's it, key because. Because yeah, that for, drives it. You're right. I don't know if as many people would do it if there wasn't that, you know. You have to, you have to realize that all peer pressure isn't bad. <laughs> and so for us, we are like, how do we use peer pressure for good? And we believe this is one of the most effective use of peer pressure because every every uh, parent wants their child to be celebrated, and they also want to be celebrated as a parent. So to give them an opportunity to get up on the stage and to see other parents who are doing it before them who are saying, hey, I'm going to help my child read the Bible, it's this healthy, this positive peer pressure. And, and, and to see that many parents every year saying, hey, we're going to do this with our kids, and then to get feedback saying, hey, we actually made it through the whole book of Mark uh, has been really, really encouraging for us. Yeah, that's awesome. And then another one you have after that, a few years later, is the blessing. So what's the yes. blessing? How does that work? What's that look like? Yeah, so the blessing, um, so it's based off of the book by Gary Smalley called The Blessing. Um, you know, this one this one came about uh, quite a few years ago when we were in uh, a main service, and our, and our senior pastor, Steve Poe, he was, um, he was doing a message on the father wound. And at the end of the uh, service, um, he said, hey, I— if you are here and you're a man here and you, you never feel, you don't feel like your dad um, ever prayed a blessing or spoke a blessing over you, we're going to create space for you. And I've asked a bunch of the elders of our church, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the wiser men of our church to come forward, and they're going to pray over you. And, and we, we thought there would be some that would come forward, but we never, ever expected the response. It was almost as if more people were trying to go forward. Then we're trying to leave the auditorium. 
And it was one of the most emotional services I've ever been a part of, as you watched all of these men just bawling, waiting for these elders that they don't even know uh, to pray over them and to pray a blessing because they never received it from their earthly dad. And we thought, this is a problem. You know, dads don't know how to share. Uh, they don't know how to share the blessing with their kids. They don't know how to pray over their kids. They don't know how to call out what's good in their kids. And so we started, uh, we do these separate, we do a, we do a father, son, or again, when I say father, Nick, you need to understand that I mean father figure. We've had life group leaders. We've had uh, grandpas drive from Florida to be a part of it. We've had uncles, yeah. we've had stepdads. Um, we, we try not to limit it. We've even had moms do some of these things, but it's, it's just, for sake of our conversation, it's sometimes easier to say dads, and I know that we need to work on that language a little bit. But um, So we do a father-son um, event, and we call it the man event, um, and it's basically like medieval themed, and, and you eat everything with your hands, like we have no silverware. And, <laughs> and then um, we prep the dads ahead of time, what is a blessing and how to do it. Uh, in fact, we, we give them some right now media tools if they want to do it, not a whole lot do, but like uh, Raising a Modern Day Night by Robert Lewis. And, stuff like that. But, but we send them an email and say, here's what a blessing is. And you need to write a letter uh, that focuses on this. But then during dinner, they're eating with their hands and we'll get like giant turkey legs and, and, you know, mashed potatoes. And, you know, it's just a man's meal. And in the middle of the meal, uh, we'll have, we'll have a dad, we'll just be able to stand up and he'll say, man and young man, I present to you Corbin Broadbeck of Noblesville and all the other dads in the place will yell Corbin Broadbeck of Noblesville. And then that dad will say, and I am proud of Corbin because of this. And he'll publicly uh, say why he's proud of him. And then after dinner, um, we have them go off and they have almost a private ceremony where it's just the dad and the son. And they actually go through the blessing that we taught them how to do. And just praying over their sons, saying, here's what I see you becoming. Uh, you're getting ready to become a young man. And, and, and here's where we see that you're growing. And, and here's why I'm proud of you. Uh, and it's a powerful event. And so we started doing that one year, and then the opposite year, we do one for mothers and daughters, uh, or mother figures and daughters, and we call it the board and brunch. Uh, for girls, we find that, that crafting seems to be a great environment, and so we kind of turn our entire student rooms at our campuses into like a, an art studio, and, and so just last weekend, actually, um, our student ministry staff was cutting 800 boards, and because we're getting ready for our next one, and and staining them. And, and then when they come, um, the moms have picked, um, we gave them a list of characteristics to pick about their daughter that they see that they are, or they're hoping they continue to become as they grow into a woman. And so then they take these, um, they take these boards and we have a brunch and then they, they sit these boards in front of them, put the last name on, and they put these stencils on the board with these characteristics and they paint them. And as they're painting them, it gives the mom an opportunity to say, hey, did, I picked this one for you uh, because this is what I see in you. And I see how God's made you unique. And, and this is a blessing. And you need to realize how awesome this is that God gave you this gift. And it's, he's going to use this in your future life. And so um, it's a chance for moms to have an intentional conversation about what they see uh, is, is growing in their daughters. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So you do it every other year too. So you're only doing one a year and you invite fifth and sixth yep. grade. Yep. Because you know, again, you're only doing it once every two years. I think yeah. that's hard as opposed to doing both every year. Yep. We're doing them every other year. And a lot of these we do every other year. <laughs> that's great. And then the, another one is defining purity. Yeah. And that's probably similar to, as probably the start of that chili bowl, I guess. Yeah, it is. It's, okay. it's totally. And, and so, uh, you know, we actually, I just had a conversation uh, last week we're, we're going to change the name of that just because, um, we're kind of taking the lead from what I, what I heard on a podcast from orange. Uh, and then also I heard Jim Burns say something about it and, and that they're removing the name purity, uh, because purity could be lost in a moment. Uh, purity, uh, is something that you either have or you don't, and they're changing to sexual integrity. Uh, and so I think we're switching the name of that to pursuing sexual integrity because sexual integrity uh, is something that you can choose over and over and over again. Even when we make mistakes, we can choose that today I'm going to, I'm going to pursue sexual integrity. But for us, um, there's two different events in that, that we rotate every other year. Um, one is, uh, one is the, ch the chili bowl. Um, we had to call it the chicken bowl this year because we got some Christian chicken, a little Chick-fil-A because our numbers have grown so much that we had to, uh, we had to do it earlier in the day to get all the football in and, and we didn't want people <laughs> eating chili at lunch and then trying to play three games of football with chili on their bellies. Yeah. Uh, that could cause some like disaster. Um, so <laughs> the local Chick-fil-A was nice enough to Good donate call. the chicken. So we, we switched that to chicken. 
Uh, but uh, we did that, and I kind of explained that. And the other one we do is a, it's a father-daughter uh, ball. Uh, again, it's kind of a dress-up. The girls come early. We get a lot of people in our church that love to do the hair, the makeup, and and all of that. And um, and so they get dressed up, and and then we just kind of have an awesome uh, father-daughter dinner. Um, and then uh, we'll get some a father-daughter combo that gets up and speaks. And and really, it's it's about saying, hey, I'm your dad, um, and uh, you need to know that I'm willing to fight for you. And I, and I want to fight for you because you matter and you're the most, you need, uh, you need a man that wants to fight for your sexual integrity. And, um, then it gives the daughters a chance to respond to that. Um, because I think a lot of daughters, uh, maybe they want that. They just don't know how to say to their dad, like, Hey, I'm giving you permission to care about me. I'm giving you permission to get into my business a little bit and, and to help me set boundaries and to help me, uh, figure out which is the right kind of guy for me to date in the future and that kind of thing. And so, uh, we, we create space for them to go off and have kind of a private conversation. They're not getting up in front of everybody. They're not, they're not doing a public ceremony there as much as they're going off privately, uh, to have a conversation between the two of them. And again, we've prepped the dads on how to have that conversation, a letter to write to their daughters, uh, and kind of a bracelet or something that we've, we've bought that they can give them, uh, to kind of say, Hey, I'm your dad and, and I want to fight for you and, and you matter. And, uh, it's such an emotional night, but it's such an awesome, awesome night. Yeah. yeah. Bet. That's cool. Um, now in both cases, that's father, daughter, father, son. What about yeah. moms in this? Yeah. Uh, we switched that to identity. Um, so that's where the, the next one comes in affirming identity. Um, we tell think, um, yeah, tell us about yeah. That. yeah. So, so, there's just something about moms, uh, that, that know us, you know what I mean? Like, like, you know, dads, dads obviously know us, but moms, like they, they have that empathy where they can actually just put themselves inside of us and know exactly what we're feeling and thinking at any moment. And there's nobody outside of God that knows us better than our moms. Uh, and so, uh, for us, for girls, um, we believe that one of the most important conversations that you can have with a teenage girl is about their identity. Um, we believe that's important about guys too, but specifically when I think about girls, uh, we get our identity. Um, our world tells us we get our identity from one of three things. I believe they tell us that, that you are what you look like. Um, you are, um, who you control or you are what you're involved in. Uh, but none of those things are real identity, but that's really where we start to form and think about ourselves is from those three things. Our real identity is that God created us. And when he created us, he said, I put my image inside of you. And there are certain characteristics that God gave uniquely to us that are part of him that make us us. And so for, for girls, we wanted moms to be able to speak into those things that make them just them, that God gave them that is so unique, that is so much his characteristics, but make them awesome. And so when I first started this, um, again, this was probably seven years ago, eight years ago, we did our first one. I thought, what do girls like? Oh, they love the mall. So I made this like mall scavenger hunt and moms and daughters went off and did it. And all I heard after it was, that was so lame. They, they, they thought it was like the worst uh, thing that we could have possibly done for them uh, because they're like, uh, the boys get to do like fun stuff, like play, you know, play football and eat with their hands and. And so I said, fine. Uh, so we have a, at, at one of our campuses, we have a 3K, a 4K, and a 5K cross-country course that a lot of the community uses. And so I went over to the grounds lady and I was like, hey, how do you feel about uh, digging up the cross-country course? And she said, sounds awesome. What are we going to do? So we ran in an excavator and, and we started digging mud pits all over our cross-country course. And we, we created the, the mudder daughter mud run. It was a 1.5 mile mud obstacle course on our campus. It had like a giant slip and slide down a hill into a mud pit and walls they had to climb over and tires they had to jump through. I mean, it was, it was nuts. Um, and we've stuck with it, but basically the idea is they come early. They dress up as mom daughter teams. Uh, we do a brunch. We have a speaker talk on identity and then they go out and they run this mud obstacle course. And they get covered head to toe in mud. And, and when you cross the finish line, uh, we hand the girls a letter that their mom had written about them. And the mom and the daughter, they just go and sit on the hill. And the mom gets a chance to say, hey, uh, right now you are not pretty. Uh, you stink and you're covered in mud. But you're beautiful. And let me tell you why. 
And uh, the mom gets to just read this letter uh, that she's written about all these characteristics that God's put inside of her daughter outside of who she, what she looks like, who she controls, or what she's involved in. And said, these are who make you you, and you never forget it. And again, it's become one of those things where moms walk away. They feel like the champion because they gave their daughter a fun day, but they got to have a really deep and serious conversation about identity. We do the same thing for uh, sons and, and, mo- uh, and moms. It's kind of like an amazing race type thing around town. Uh, but again, that leads them to have a conversation about respect and, and, and helping them understand who they are and who mom sees in them and what, what she hopes and dreams for them. So That's awesome. Yeah. I, I love, and you have, you also have, you know, we didn't talk baby dedication, uh, yeah. family experience. We didn't talk about yep. transitioning, graduating seniors. Uh, yeah. Again, we, you know, we, you can spend even more time on that, but with the little time we have left, so, I want to ask yep. just a couple questions about how it works overall. Um, yeah. How do new parents learn about it. Right. So if you've been coming for a long time, you've probably been yeah. somewhere, but is it, is there any intentional way that if you come in as a new parent, maybe yeah. your kids two, maybe your kids 10, you know what I mean? Yep. Like, how do you try to help new families know what the family framework is? Yeah, so we have a first-time guest uh, welcome wall uh, where all of our first-time guests come uh, with kids. They come and they check in there. So kids and students check in at that wall. And, and as they sign in, we, we give them a little flyer that we've created uh, for the younger kids that goes inside a pencil pouch. And, and um, we use that moment right there to talk about how we have the family framework. Um, on that wall, we also have kind of the, the orange jars, you know, the, the time, when you see how much time you have left, it makes every week matter. Mm-hmm. So we have those jars displayed on that wall. And we'll actually take time right there um, to, to actually uh, use the design of our building to say, so, you know, your child's this long, so this is how many weeks you have left with them. And, and we believe that when you see how much time you have left, it makes every week matter. And so here's some ways as a church that we've developed a framework to help you uh, as a parent win. And so here's our three-part strategy, home, what we're going to do here at church, and then here's the family framework, which is part three. And you're right here. And so we'd love to have you come to our next one. And we just kind of push it that way. Um, we also, man, one thing I tried, Nick, this is like one of my, my biggest failures, but I still think it's going to work. Um, so at all of our campuses, we have like this giant marble roller. Um, again, I'm not an engineer, but I thought this was a great idea. And so right now it's working at two of the seven campuses if it tells you how good it works. But there's a button that you push and it drops a marble from the top and it rolls down this marble roller. And on the marble roller is actually each of the levels of the family framework labeled on there. So that as a kid comes and their mom's checking in, we walk the kid over to the marble roller and they push the button. At one of our campuses, we call it the disappointment button because it hasn't worked for so long. But anyway, uh, so anyway, it's the visual. And so all of the campuses have the visual of the marble roller. Two of them, it actually rolls. Uh, and so we're still working on making those things work. Uh, but then uh, as you walk down our hallways of our kids' wing, um, I believe that design, you can use the design of your building to cast vision. You know, we only get, think about this, in kids' ministry, you only get drop off and pick up time, five minutes of drop off and five minutes of pick up time to really cast vision to your parents. Outside of that, they're, they're, they're gone doing their own thing. And, and yeah, we may get, you know, family weekend or family series some years where we can really cast vision. We don't get a lot of time as kids and student pastors uh, to cast vision to parents. And so we're really trying to figure out how do we use our building as a way to cast vision. So above, above every door, uh, as you walk down our kids wing, we have those same jars labeling how much, t- how many weeks you have left. Um, so like if you had a tiny or which is our tiny's one is our nursery, you know, it'll say 936 weeks and have a jar above that door as a visual. Um, and then as you go into our rooms, we try and use vinyls on the wall to kind of cast vision. Like, um, you know, um, the idea of love over time, uh, creates a place for kids, uh, to belong. It's not exactly what that one says, but off the top of my head, something like that, yeah, uh, just to kind of cast vision. And we're trying to, we're trying to do that all the way down the hall. So as you have a first time guest, we're walking down the hall and, and we're pointing out these things, uh, that are helping them see. And on the back of every t-shirt, it says every week matters. And we're just trying to help keep that vision ahead of parents so that when they hear us do an event or maybe we do baby dedication, we always say, Hey, this is part of our family framework. And these parents took a class. It starts to connect the dots. Or when I get to speak on a weekend and I get to talk about the family framework, it starts to cast the vision a little bit further uh, because it, it takes time to build it. It for sure does. And how about like existing parents, you know, how do yeah. you remind them of the framework? And I imagine as you promote each thing, that's a mm-hmm. reminder that, hey, this is part of the framework. But like how yep. do you do that? How do you keep them 
uh, you know, engage yeah. with that, knowing where they are, what steps they should take, what's next. Yep. All that. Yeah. So we use our database a lot for that and we'll send direct uh, emails or texts uh, based on that. Uh, but we've done, we've been pretty intentional about creating a brand for the family framework. So they all have the kind of same look and feel so that when something's getting advertised, it's part of the framework. You'll see the wood look and the, it's, it has the family framework logo on it to kind of connect it. And then, like I said, anytime it's either advertised in a uh, weekend service, you know, as part of an announcement time or whether it's on the stage for baby dedication or Bible presentation, uh, we'll always connect it back and say, Hey, this is part of the family framework. And if you don't know where this is, we put a flyer. We'll often put flyers um, in every worship program the week of, of those things so that we can kind of keep it in front of parents because it is something vision always leaks. And so you got to try and keep it in front of parents as much as possible. That's awesome. Well, that's a great plan you've put together. How long has it been since it's been like complete? You know what I mean? Or at least as it is now with the nine is I think. It's yeah, like I think I think we're, we're, we're close to we're coming up on five years, I think, this year. That's great. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Running that for a long time there. Well, I appreciate you taking time to come on the podcast and, and share it with us. And like you said, we can, anything you're willing to share, I'm sure people will love. We'll put that in the show notes and they can go to the website. We'll put that in the show notes too and, you know, see what it looks like there. I think that'll be really helpful. So Kurt, thanks for taking time to come on the podcast. How can people connect with you? If they Absolutely. Have yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, 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 Probably an email guy is the best, uh, which my email is just kurt.broadbeck at northviewchurch.us. Uh, I am on social media, um, but I'll be honest, I don't check it as often. <laughs> well, I, I'm happy I don't check it as often as, as maybe I should. So uh, you can find me on Facebook and stuff like that or Twitter very rarely, Instagram a little more. But for the most part, just find me on email, and I'd love to talk to you about it uh, if this was helpful at all. For sure, we'd love to give you any of our resources and share them with you or let you have them. Um, but anyway, yeah. I think you're going to get a lot of context. This is good stuff that you've created there, so kudos to you and to the team. I'm sure it's been a lot of hands have been in it. We have the best team, Nick. That's the thing. Yeah, it, this is all teamwork. None of this is done in a vacuum for sure, and so I, I'm pretty proud of the kids and kids pastors and the student pastors that are around me, so it's pretty good. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for sharing it with us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Nick. Appreciate it. Well, I love what Kurt and the team there have put together. That family framework is excellent. I love how it is on the website, and people can check it out there. Again, I love how they are hosting events to do this with families, but they're also empowering families to do this stuff on their own. So it's not always something they have to host and put that work into. It's something they can give to families, and they and they can do on their own. A few action items that I think of – Coming out of this interview, one, check out the family frame, framework for sure. Click that link. Look at the different things they do. I think a second step would be to evaluate what you do. Most of us do something in terms of helping parents you know, with kids that are transitioning from one age group to the next or with milestones such as baby dedication or graduation or something like that, uh, baptism, salvation. So I would look at your plan, maybe even write it up, and then evaluate what needs to change, what needs to improve what needs to be added and pick the next thing you want to do. I mean, it's hard to, to say like, you know, Kurt has, Oh, I want nine things in my family framework and just go working for nine things. It's easier to say, okay, where are we? What do we like? What is the most important thing we can work on right now? Cause again, you can't, you can't work on everything. So what's the most important thing you can work on right now? And maybe you're going to add something that Kurt has as part of their family framework Maybe it's something different that you thought about that you want to add to the plan. I think that those would be the, the three steps. Check out the family framework, evaluate your plan, and determine what your one next step is going to be. Are you going to add something, remove something that's not working, tweak, you know, improve something, and help families even more? So as usual, you can get the show notes at nicklevins.com slash episode 143. If you will be at the Orange Conference, let me know. Be sure to come hang out with us either on Yuli Day for lunch, which you can email me about that, or uh, drop by and visit us at the booth or the suite uh, on Thursday or Friday. Uh, and we hope to connect with you there. So I hope this has been helpful. I sure loved it. I'm still talking with Kurt about this, and I've probably brought this up in so many conversations since Kurt and I recorded because I know it's been helpful to me, and I think it will be helpful to others as well. So hope you have a great week, and I'll catch you next time on the Family Ministry Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. We hope this helps you maximize your church's potential. We would love to hear stories of how you apply what you've learned. 
You can do that by leaving a comment on iTunes or in the show notes at nickblevins.com.